look at this fine, fine house on a beautiful spring day here in New York City. Welcome to the World Science Festival. It's so great. The World Science Festival, I don't know if you realize, is actually an elegant proof of quantum mechanics because for the four days of uh, the festival, both Brian Green and Tracy Day are in six places at once. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we love that about this festival. It's uh, great to be here. I mean, I love this venue, the Cooper Union. I mean, filled with old socialists. I mean, come on, this is a fabulous place here. Arguing about this and that. I mean, imagine all the scientists that we could pack into this room having an argument. I mean, there'd be the Pope over there, and there'd be, you know, uh, Rutherford over here, and, and uh, maybe, you know, uh, Letterman over here, and uh, not David. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, the Pope would be saying, the, the world began 4004 BC. And over here they'd say, oh, but it was a big bang. Yes, it was a big bang in 4000 BC. And uh, people would be shouting and screaming. Let's try to simulate that if we could, because this is a great hall of the abolitionist movement. I mean, there were spirited, passionate debates here. Over here, you say, the earth is flat. It's obvious. Everybody. That's ridiculous. The earth is round. Now mix it up. That's the idea. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. Science and story is our mission. And uh, what is science but the story of our understanding of the world, the story of civilization on some level, um, the story of great discoveries. And so science and literature merge. And, and do I have a great job or what? I mean, Brian mentioned that, you know, I have this radio show, The Takeaway, and... and uh, what that show allows me to do, I've been doing radio and TV for years as a journalist. I mean, what you get to do as a journalist is something, I'm sure some of you know this, it's called strand binging. <laughs> Any of you strand bingers here? For those of you who are out of town, The Strand, of course, is a spectacular bookstore here in the city of New York, and they're selling books actually outside tonight, and you're welcome to purchase uh, any of the books that may uh, hit your fancy tonight. But strand binging is you get a big bag like this, empty, and you go to the strand, or you can go to any bookstore, any independent bookstore, or Barnes & Noble even, it's totally fine. You can binge at Barnes & Noble. So alliteration works there. Barnes & Noble binging, you know, that works. I, I prefer strand binging. You go in there, you just pick out just a bunch of stuff. Just, you know, um, I mean, let me tell you what I got right here. A a any strand bingers in the audience, by the way, who go and just buy way too many books? Yeah, right, exactly. All right, so um, Stephen Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature, words coined by Abraham Lincoln, who once spoke here, right? Right? Uh, it's all about, apparently it's all about, like, violence has declined in the world. Um, and I guess if you're a tenured professor at Harvard, you can be optimistic about <laughs> our civilization. Um, <clears throat> so uh, then, then, oh, man, Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> Carthage is her latest here. Man, I better finish this because her next book is coming out in about an hour. <laughs> I think, yeah. Um, and, uh, and then here's, here's, some interesting, here's some interesting stuff. The, the particle at the end of the universe, it's about the, the Higgs boson. Any fans of the Higgs boson here? Yeah. I have all their albums. They're outrageous. They're fantastic. Um, anyway, this is great. This is a real immersion into physics. It's all about the, uh, it's all about the, uh, the super collider and the discovery of the Higgs boson, or what may be the discovery of the Higgs boson, and we should have that argument. You over on this side say, we've discovered the Higgs boson. You say, no, 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 we may have discovered the Higgs boson, right? Over here, over here. And you say, yeah, see, that is actually what's going on in physics right now, and uh, we've done it right here in this room. And what else did I find? Oh, this is great, this is really great. This book by Joe Marchand, um, The Shadow King, it's all about how um, the early Egyptologists who got, who got the King Tut's body out of the tomb essentially ransacked it like a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, thieves knocking over a 7-Eleven on a Saturday night. And uh, they actually did autopsies on the mummy, which have about as much sophistication as a, you know, a teenager uh, dissecting a frog, you know, as, as part of their, like, science project. And it's, it, it's really interesting how the science of Egyptology and archaeology has changed over time, and I'm very, very interested in this. And then this one here is another book by, by Joe, and uh, 
decoding the heavens about ancient Greeks and the development of an astronomical computer 2,000 years ago. I knew nothing about this, nothing about this. And then, you know, you always, when you go strand binging, right, it's um, history, nonfiction, political, strange, 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 weird, something you'll never read, something you might read, and then you gotta, you gotta do a classic, right? Dr. O, I mean, hello. <laughs> Andrew's brain, and this seems great. To me, I, mean, I read a little bit of it, and uh, loony. Uh, and, and a total stretch for him. I mean, this is about as far from ragtime as uh, anything he's ever written. And uh, you know, I, I don't know how often you go strand binging, but uh, I do it enough so that sometimes I actually actually dream about it at night. <laughs> and one time, I had this I had this dream that I was, you know strand binging, I grabbed a bunch of books, and I went and sat in a park, you know, and I was just sitting there, cracking open the books, looking at them, you know, and then something happened in my dream. As I was sitting there in this park, suddenly the authors of the books that I binged started to appear in the park. They sort of walked over and sat next to me. These legendary authors. I mean, is this crazy or what? I mean, they walked over, they sat down. It was like that scene in Woody Allen's Annie Hall, right? When Marshall McLuhan comes up to Woody Allen and they actually talk about an argument. And suddenly I'm surrounded by these books and here are these authors, people who I'm really curious about, legendary authors. I mean, it's astounding. <clears throat> of course, that would never happen. <laughs> anyway, welcome to, uh, to uh, the right angle, science and story. Thanks for being here, and thanks for indulging my little shtick here. It's great to have you here. <laughs> And just for those of you who are playing at home, Sean Carroll, E.L. Doctor O, Joe Marchant, Joyce Carroll Oates, and Steven Pinker. And uh, let's just say, do you have any idea why we picked the five of you? <coughs> yes! <laughs> I love it. I know why you picked them. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, right, that's exactly right. Yeah, all of you know why the others were picked. It's, it's why you're here that you don't quite understand. Um, well, part of uh, the mix here is in the case of you, Sean, and you, Joe, you are scientists, doctorate in genetics. That was a long time ago. I don't long really time. Yeah, right, see yeah. myself as a scientist. And don't try to pass yourself off as a geneticist here. Right? You'll get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you are a doctorate in physics. That's right. Right? Um, but you embraced writing for a lay audience. You still do uh, scientific papers. Publicly. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, of course, a scientist, right, at Harvard. It's psychology, right? Psychology. Psychology, that's right, yes. Right. right. And why did the three of you go from scientific rigorous research to writing? Did you want to put on a different hat, Stephen? Uh, what I was doing was too interesting to keep to myself and my colleagues. I, the world uh, was interested in how the mind works and how language works, and I thought it's uh, part of my responsibility as a scientist and as a professor to, to share it. The taxpayers pay for the research, they have a right to the insights and the fascinating discoveries that, uh, that, that we make. So I, I thought it was part of my uh, responsibility that as a scientist. Crazy virtuous there. That is <laughs> outrageous. Whoa. Uh, Joe, how about you? Oh, mine was a lot more selfish than that. That's okay. I don't, I don't think I have the patience or the determination to be a scientist, but as a journalist, Every week I get to talk to somebody who spent their entire career getting to an amazing, exciting, you know, breakthrough point, and then I get to talk to them about it. So, you know, it, it'll be a different field every time, and then I get that access, I get to share in that, and then I get to write about it. And at Caltech, you, of course, it's the taxpayers that are paying for your research, and... Yeah. Well, Steve already took my virtuous yeah, response, yeah, yeah. so I'll admit that it's just fun. I, you know, it's fun to write, it's fun uh, to share this excitement, but also when you're doing science, 
You're always at the edge of the stuff we don't understand, and you're struggling, and you don't know what's going on. And then when you do know what's going on, you move on to the next thing. But in, in the writing, you get to sort of linger and cherish those moments when you figured something out. In the case of you, Edgar, and you, Joyce, um, you are, of course, writers, but is there something about science that intrigues you either in terms of a character or a domain of, of content? Uh, certainly, you spent a lot of time talking about what goes on in the brain uh, in your latest book. Yes, but um, <clears throat> the difference, I think, here is that um, the scientists, professional scientists, whatever field, uh, find an intrinsic value in science, whereas um, we fiction writers uh, see it as an extrinsic value. That, that is to say, um, we, what, we take what we can use from it for our own purposes. So, so if, if, if you need to, you rip off scientists. If you need to rip off cops, you rip off cops. If you need to rip off, right. right. It's, it's really a lower form of uh, uh, exploitation, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another virtuous uh, response. Uh, Joyce, how, how would you respond to the uh, intersection of science and your work as a novelist and a storyteller? Well, both Edgar and I are really chroniclers of American history and American culture just American life, and science is part of that. But I think the most exciting feature of science in the 19th century, let's say, is the, is the discovery of, of evolution or evolutionary theory. And it's really the, an intersection with culture, with religion. So if you're interested in American culture and religion and you know, popular life in America, <clears throat> the incursion of Darwinian evolutionary theory into that is very natural. So in writing about one, you, you would inevitably write, be writing about the other. And I mean, so much of the American story, and I guess the global story of modernity, is about the encounter of populations with the implications of scientific discovery. That's philosophical in the case of Darwin. But there's also the story of electricity and how it changed cities. And um, there's some great books. Eric Larson wrote a great book about how lighting in, in the cities uh, changed Chicago, and he wrote a whole big murder mystery around it. Uh, it's really, really an amazing story that's all about American history. Um, would you say that you ever wanted to be a scientist, Edgar? Why? Yeah. Well, um, no, I um, see, I went to the Bronx High School of Science. I, I know. And I found myself hanging out with kids who were going around predicting, in some cases correctly, that they were going to win the Nobel Prize in physics. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that immediately drove me to the office where the literary magazine was uh, <laughs> being published. And there, my future was made there, right? What novelists do you particularly like, Sean? There's a lot of novelists. Uh, the ones with some science in them, I, you know, I would say people like Thomas Pynchon. You have to say Tom Stoppard, the playwright, uh, not a novelist. But I like the people who can uh, use science without making it too much like a lecture. I've had enough lectures in my life. I get those very easily. When I go to read a novel or watch a play or see a movie or TV show, I want to be entertained and provoked. And if there is a scientific angle there, if they're able to make use of science in some provocative way, then that's really great. Joe, um, is your work in some sense a memoir of your discovery of these various stories and interesting scenes and sort of subcultures in the case of Egyptology and uh, the Greek archaeologists and sponge divers that you write so beautifully about? I guess the Shadow King was more that than decoding the heavens. So the Shadow King was very much a, a personal journey. I kind of went out to talk to these people and reconstruct this story because Egyptology is such a, a show. You know, we get these really big budget National Geographic and Discovery documentaries and these headlines, scientific findings. Um, and it, everything is, you know, all the science that's done is paid for by TV companies and, you know, everything's very theatrical. Um, so I just wanted to go behind the scenes, what's it really like in the basement of the Egyptian Museum or in Tutankhamun's tomb or where are the archives held or who are these people who, you know, who is the geneticist that took the DNA from Tut's mummy and why do these people even want to do this work? What's driving them? I suppose I was much more interested in those people and their stories than in the actual scientific results. Stephen, um, you have an editor, right? Oh, yes. Uh, is is <laughs> your sure. editor a tenured professor at Harvard? No, no. Is she, is, is she a psychologist? No. no. Wendy Wolf. Does she have a doctorate? Books. Yeah. 
she she does not, but she is a uh, a brilliant editor. Uh, really, and, and she can tell you to oh, get yes. rid of that paragraph and. Uh, she, uh, she does not micromanage, but she will say, this doesn't make any sense, or I'm not following you, and then leaves it to me to fix the problem. And that's the kind of editor I like to work with uh, the best. So, in fact, the exact opposite of your students at Harvard. <laughs> yes. Uh, I also have a, uh, I've worked with a copy editor for most of my books, uh, from whom I've learned a lot about both the mechanics of punctuation and uh, capitalization, but also coherence and uh, clarity and consistency, uh, Katya Rice, who I've worked with for more than 30 years. Uh, at one point, I uh, had to work with a different copy editor for one of my writings, and I was so disgruntled that I decided to write my own style manual to, uh, because I thought that this copy editor was miseducated on rules of grammar, and so I had to write my own book so that no See, one else would th be that's, that's the kind of terror that I think <laughs> you would inspire in, in editors sometimes. Um, Sean, is the mission when you're writing a book from your editor's perspective that, hey, if I don't get it, man, no one else will, so it's got to work for me. Or do you want to, uh, it's a little familiar there maybe, um, or are you trying to sort of dump people into the real sort of debate as it happens, the, 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 the language as the scientists use it in the, in the moments that they're experiencing the discoveries? I think my editor is all too willing to let things go that make no sense to him whatsoever. So maybe more of that would be helpful. But I think that it, it's the boring answer here, but it's a little bit of both. Uh, the first book, From Eternity to Here, that I wrote was much more about bringing people right to the mind-bending ideas at the forefront of research. Even if some of those ideas are from the 19th century, it's still stuff that we're not familiar with in our everyday lives. The Higgs boson book is much more about telling a ripping yarn and getting people uh, caught up in the process of discovering this wonderful thing. But even there, you know, I can't help but have a couple of chapters that really say, okay, now you've had your fun and we're going to eat some vegetables here and we're going to think about why forces of nature arise because of symmetries that independently hold at every point in space-time. Uh. So uh, have you ever channeled, uh, it, 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 some of your uh, writing about boxing is some of the best writing about boxing that I've ever, ever read. I'm such an admirer of your work. But it seems like one of the talents that you have, Joyce, is to be able to inhabit a character that, to both the reader and I suspect to you on some level, is remote. And yet you go there and inhabit that character. It's some of the mission of science writing in the sense that scientists are, by definition, in some cases, remote from all of us. How do you do that? What, what, do you, what, what, what is exciting to you about that? Well, it's an interesting question, which I think writers are often asked, but I don't think there's anything mystical or mysterious about it. I don't have a conception of, of being an artist or a poet of the kind that, that Plato had, that this is a demonic uh, channeling and that the conscious mind is not really aware of what's going on. I don't have, that's not really my, my feeling about literature at all. Literature is a text. It's, it's a, it's a creation of language, and the text is in, it, it's, it has a structure. Sentences have a certain coherence or rhythm. You can choose if they want short sentences, longer sentences, or a mixture. You choose, the, you choose the way that the page looks. You know, there's a good deal that's very conscious, and the pacing and the movement of writing has something in common maybe with, with music. You know, these things that are very much of the conscious mind. But the main thing about writing and storytelling is that one feels one has an exciting and original story to tell that has some surprises. And so whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction or memoir, you basically are starting out at a certain point and then you are going to be a little surprised yourself by what, what develops. And that's the great excitement and the thrill of writing and also reading. Edgar, how was your research for the book Waterworks, which I think involved probably a certain amount of engineering, if not science, and your research for this latest book uh, on the brain to understand some of the things that you write about with such fluency? You're asking uh, how much research I do? <laughs> of course it was voluminous, uh, I, I know. Oh, well, my answer is just enough. <laughs> <laughs> But it's interesting that you mentioned the waterworks. Um, briefly, uh, for the most of you who haven't read that book, 
Uh, it takes place in the uh, in New York City during the Boss Tweed era. And a young man uh, sees a coach going by in the street with a bunch of old men, including his father, except that his father has died, as, as he understands it. And he's so possessed by this image and traumatized that he gets a friend of his um, to help him uh, inter the body. And they go up to Woodlawn Cemetery and pry, up the, pry open the coffin. And his father isn't in the coffin. A child is in the coffin. And it turns out that this Dr. Sartorius, Reed Sartorius, is keeping old men alive in this place uh, using the materials, the blood of children who uh, usually do not survive his treatment. So did you see um, something that came out in the New York Times about two weeks ago about how researchers discovered that if they inject old mice with the blood of young mice, the, the old mice are revived. A friend of mine who's a scientist, Martin Niemer, uh, said I deserve the Nobel Prize in medicine. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, you should get your application in on that. Uh. That was the idea of Dracula. I mean, it was, yeah. It was the whole idea of... But it's, re it's really weird, but it, it, it just shows you that there's, there's some endowment that comes with uh, making things up. Sean, uh, part of the story of science, and uh, Edgar refers to it there a little bit, is the ways in which scientific discoveries, particularly really abstract scientific discoveries, are internalized by the population. Um, it seemed for most of the 20th century, and I didn't live for most of the 20th century, but I was born mid-century, that um, the idea of relativity was very remote and, and incomprehensible to most Americans, and that people had an intuitive sense of Newtonian mechanics. And of course, if you read the story of Isaac Newton and what he talked about and gravity and all of that, um, it seemed as though people grasped Newton much more quickly, although it actually did take a few hundred years, um, compared with what they thought was going on before that, versus relativity, which I thought, oh, well, we'll just understand what relativity is. And, and it, didn't, it didn't really occur to me that we were internalizing relativity until movies like The Matrix began to play with this sort of time travel business. And then all of a sudden, it seems in the last 20, 25 years that some aspects of relativity have been internalized and become part of uh, popular culture. How do you observe that phenomenon as a scientist, and where do you think the Higgs boson is going to end up in popular <laughs> culture? I think that phenomenon would be awesome uh, if it were true. I'm, I'm not sure that even undergraduates have quite internalized uh, relativity yet, uh, and quantum mechanics is quite a ways off. I mean, immediately after this, I'm racing down to do another World Science Festival event where a bunch of us professors are going to argue about what quantum mechanics means, because the theory has been there for uh, most of the 20th century, and we still don't understand it yet. What's Relativity. the argument sound like? What's, the argu what's that argument sound like? Oh, it's the as argument technically is... technically as you could probably say it. Don't try to dumb us down, okay? All right, no, okay. So, <laughs> the wave function is an element of Hilbert space. No. The, what? Uh, <laughs> Hilbert space? That's ridiculous. That's right, yes. I think, you know, to go back to your question, the, the, we think that Newtonian mechanics seems intuitive to us. It isn't. I mean, Newtonian mechanics says that if you don't exert a force on something, it keeps moving at a constant velocity forever. Aristotelian mechanics says that in order to keep something moving, you have to keep pushing it. And that is very intuitive to us, because it's true. In the real world, you have to keep pushing something. And there's this great leap that Galileo and Newton made that says, let's ignore friction and air resistance. And they invented physics and much of modern science by doing that. But Newtonian mechanics is closer to our intuition. Relativity is further than that. Quantum mechanics is even further than that. In quantum mechanics, the rules that we give people in textbooks say that there's one kind of thing that happens when you're looking at something and another kind of thing that happens when you're not looking at it. And we don't like that and we, no one really thinks that's true and yet we teach it to every second year physics student uh, that comes along. So we're trying to do better than that. And this is the least surprising thing in the world. As science gets better and better at understanding the world in a more and more quantitative, full, complete way, of course it's going to be completely different than our intuition, which is 
trained by a very limited realm of experience, right? We don't see things every day that move close to the speed of light. We don't see things that are the size of an electron we or the size of the universe. every day that move at the speed of light. We, I'm, I know, yeah. Right. I, I hesitated when I was saying Sorry, that, no. and yeah, I saw the trap come down. Okay. They're in the wrong but, hall to screw around <laughs> like that, Sean, I'm telling and you. And this is, and you know, philosophers know this well. This is, Willard Sellers talked about the manifest image the image that we all have in our, in our minds about what's happening in the world, and the scientific image. And he said the job of philosophy was to reconcile these. And the struggles of a physicist to do this are nothing compared to the struggles of a neuroscientist to do this, right? I mean, the way that we think about thinking is as wrong compared to how thinking actually happens as the way we think about matter is different than the rules of well, quantum mechanics. Let's put that to uh, Mr. Pinker here. Um, how is our intuition about the brain in a state of real flux right now, and what does that mean for you as a writer? Well, the, um, the most intuitive theory of how the, the mind works is that it is inhabited by uh, an immaterial substance, like the soul, that there, there's an eye that uses the brain the way we might use a smartphone, and it's very hard to get used to the idea that we don't use our brain, we are our brain that there isn't some animating essence that, uh, that pulls the levers of behavior and that reads the screens, but it's just neurons all the way down. I think that is the, uh, the, the, the fundamental mismatch between uh, the view of the mind given to us by neuroscience and the intuitive way of thinking of the mind that's analogous so, to the difficulty of grasping relativity and quantum mechanics. So, so the I is the letter I, and yes. the I is the camera on the smartphone. That's right, right. yes. Okay. So, which is why it's so easy for us to attribute minds to things that don't have minds, like to human-made objects, so you have idolatry, to mountains and rivers and trees, so you have animism, to uh, nothing in particular, so you've got ghosts and spirits and souls. We're so used to attributing uh, a kind of invisible essence or agency to other people when we deal with them. We don't deal with other people as brains, we deal with them as people. That it, and we uh, abstract some kind of um, immaterial force, which we can then uh, attribute to objects or natural things or to nothing in particular, and that's where you get spiritualism and a lot of uh, religious beliefs. But the idea that, that, that and in fact, there's a lot of experience that it's kind of consistent with the idea that there's an immaterial soul. Like what happens when you go to sleep and you have a dream? You know your body's been in bed the whole time, but it's very natural to think that some other part of you is up and about in the world. It's the screensaver. So, it's like the, yeah, the, yeah. the screensaver, exactly. Like what, do you, what do you say to the new metaphor, which is, my mind is a computer? Well, I think there's something to the, uh, not a computer in the sense of a uh, product that you buy for, at the Apple store or from uh, Dell, but the idea that the brain operates by the processing of information, by signals, by codes, by transformations, uh, is a, a, I think an essential insight into demystifying the fact that this three pound hunk of matter can be intelligent, that we can do things like recognize faces, speak in grammatical sentences, pick up a pencil. To really understand that, you have to think of the brain as processing information. Computers do that too. That doesn't mean the brain is a computer any more than the eye is a camera. But on the other hand, the eye and the camera really do work by some similar principles. Uh, Joe. Describe, uh, I, mean, you've, I, I alluded to this before, the sponge divers are a great story in, in uh, your book about Greek archaeology and the uh, um, calculating machine that was discovered uh, on a ship on a shelf in the waters below Greece. Um, in telling that story, you tell the story of these sponge divers as kind of archaeologists. They're also, um, you know, characters who have lived for thousands of years in these very particular places, but they're also people who took extraordinary risks at a time when uh, uh, underwater diving became possible. The technology for exploring under the water for long periods of time, long periods of time, like an hour. Um, describe some of that. Put us in, dump us into the drink there on, on that story. Uh, the, so the sponge divers and, th okay. Um, so sponge divers in the Mediterranean had been collecting sponges for the same, the same way for thousands of years, diving down, generally naked, you know, free diving down. Just um, holding their breath. Yeah, just holding their breath, um, grabbing the sponges, coming back up. They were incredibly good at it. Um, whole sort of island's worth of 
young men in the Mediterranean would make their living that way um, until somewhere around the 1860s, somebody invented the, the diving suit, the kind of the big copper suit with the, you know, with the helmet, and then there's a, a tube that kind of runs up to a boat on the surface above, so you're breathing compressed air from the boat above. So it seemed like this amazing invention. Um, you know, you can go down deeper, you can stay down for longer, make loads more money by collecting more sponges. So it was introduced and kind of spread across the islands. There was a nice story that the, the sponge divers were a bit wary of this at first until the guy who was kind of bringing the technology um, persuaded his pregnant wife to demonstrate it and she walked down in the suit. And after that, there was no way that they were not going to go for it. They weren't going to be upstaged. There, that's one macho by a woman. dude, yeah. Um, but they had Honey, no. Honey, you do it. Yeah. <laughs> But they had no idea about the bends. So the fact that if you are breathing compressed air at depth and they went down, you know, really deep, like 60 meters or whatever, um, you're going to suffer the bends when you come back up. And tens of thousands of them died. Um, um, even more paralyzed. I mean, I had no idea until I started looking into this. I was like, why did I not know this? And it just became this. After a while, like rather than stopping, it became this kind of macho culture because there wasn't really anything else for them to, to do. So it just became this kind of live fast, die young, go out. Um, so yeah, it's just one. I suppose one of those warning stories about you know adopting new technology before you really understand what's uh, what's happening. So nothing to do with the Antikythera mechanism, but just one of those stories that you kind of uncover when you're looking into something and you never realised you were going to go down that route. But it, yeah. But it also had everything to do with it in the sense that the sponge divers embracing the technology says something about medicine. Uh, the technology transforms the biology beneath the sea because all the sponges are harvested. There's millions and millions made from harvesting these sponges until it's over harvested. And then the, the job to be done is not just sponge diving, it's actually finding archeological uh, you know, objects underneath the water. And so that affects archeology, span which affects our understanding of history and all of these technologies kind of interact, and uh, I have to say, when I was reading about the sponge divers, I really thought that would make a great novel, some sponge diver who kind of is in the intersection of all of this, because the common key is, is science in all of it. But what were you guys talking about backstage when I had to stay up here and you guys were all just sort of talking to each other at the table back there? I just noticed it what a very great chemistry. Memorable. Was it about <laughs> who's got better dinner reservations after the <laughs> Because I actually think one of the great things about this event tonight is that you would never have a yeah. panel like you guys ever together in the same We, we did talk a bit about there. writing, uh, comparing those of us who write from the beginning to the middle to the end, and those of us who can sometimes start in media race and write the last chapter first and then flesh out the Who's earlier beginning, chapters. Who's beginning, middle end? Who's beginning, middle end? Three beginning, middle end? The and, scientists. Yeah, yeah. And, and the two of you are middle, and first. That's a rather personal question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the radio guy. <laughs> Writing, um, Thomas Mann, a great German novelist, uh, defined a writer as a person who finds writing difficult. <laughs> and I can tell you a story about that if you have the patience to Please. Listen. Yes. Well, when, um, my child was in the first grade, one of my daughters. She came to me with a pad and a pencil and said, I was absent yesterday, and I'd like you to write an absence note for the teacher. So I was sitting at the kitchen table, and I started to write a note. And I said, dear Mrs. So-and-so, please forgive. And then I thought, why do I have to ask her to forgive the child? She didn't commit a crime, she had a lousy virus. So I tore that page off and threw it down. <laughs> and I started again. <laughs> my daughter Caroline, and then I thought, of course she's my daughter. Who else would be writing? <laughs> and this went on for several, till there was a pile of crumpled pages on the floor. And your daughter's freaking out, right? <laughs> The child was crying, the bus outside was blowing its horn. <laughs> and my wife said, I can't believe this, I can't believe this, and scribbled down now. So the, the moral of the story is writing is difficult, especially the short forms. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, tell us another, Uncle Edgar. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if I was uh, on a radio show right now and, and had the, uh, the foolish impulse to ask the question, you know, what is your mission as a writer? As most writers do, they say, I don't have a mission, I just do what I'm doing. But it seems to me that that question is a little bit on the table here in the sense that um, you have talked a little bit about, I want people to understand the things that I find so interesting, and I really think it's part of the people's sort of treasure that they understand the kind of research that you're permitted to do. Do you have a mission, Sean? I would like to, I would like science, which obviously affects the world we live in in this incredibly dramatic way, to be as much a part of the everyday cultural conversation as politics or sports or movies or economics or art or literature. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people write popular level science books and they say, well, we want to inspire people to become scientists, because that's how I got inspired to become a scientist, by reading books that would just sit in my local public library in the physics section and read all those books. And, but that's great, but you know, we have plenty of scientists. But I think that everybody should be interested in science, whether or not they're professional scientists or not. They should follow along, they should debate it. Every single person should have their own favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics, and that's what I'm working on. <laughs> Now, Joyce, you've been writing since you got a typewriter at age 14. I mean, actually, you've been writing novels since you got a typewriter at age 14, I believe, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I hesitate to ask, but do you have a mission when you start a book thinking about your reading public? Well, I, th I think we all want to communicate with one another. We are in a community, and um, we want to share our vision of the, our perspective of, of, of the universe, I suppose. and. I feel that the writer bears witness for people who are in some ways unable to speak for themselves. I do have a certain vision maybe of social justice and that seems to me maybe more primary to my writing than, than dealing with science, but it's not exclusive. You like the short forms as well. I mean, you're, oh, yes, a, I you're, love a, real, you're a real tweet person. <laughs> oh, t tweet? Twitter. Twitter, yeah. Twitter. <laughs> yes, that's a whole new genre of writing that's completely new. And you're, scientifically speaking, uh, how, how does it work for you? How does it work for me? Twitter, 140 characters. 140 characters. Well, it's sort of the extraction of a, th of a thought or a preference or a recommendation. Say you've read a really interesting new book by someone right here. And you don't want to write a whole article or a long book review for the New York Review of Books, you know, like 20,000 words. You just have 140 characters and you just recommend it. You send it out. And within minutes, I get responses to that. People will say, I'm going to go out and buy that book. Or I've always wanted to read that book and now I'm going to read it. So it's sort of like a dialogue with people all around the country. In fact, I did that with Stephen's book just recently. People are writing like within three minutes of saying, I had, I, I had this book on my list, and now I'm going to go out and read it. So that's kind of immediate response that most, most writers of literature, anyway, don't get, <laughs> usually. I mean, years can go by before you hear from a reader, if there even is a reader. <laughs> do you find it easy to get it into 140 characters, though? Because I'm paralyzed by that. Like, do you, how do you know? <laughs> well, it's how do you not, say what you want to say? It's not difficult. It's like saying, you know, how do you, how do you brush your teeth or something? It's, it's, it's actually not difficult. But have you tried it? Yeah, I was on for a while, but what you were saying about the sick note, that's me on, on Twitter. I'd be there for an hour, like, well, that's not quite how I want to say it. And, you know, I'm a freelancer. Nobody pays me for that, so I've had to stop now. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get paid by the character. That would be a whole different story. Then, then I might rediscover yeah, it. Yeah, then you could do your whole book in, in tweets. Um, so Somebody given did your, that as what, a UK writer. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Jennifer Egan did that, too, I oh, think, okay. as a novelist here in the United States. Or, or, or did she do it as a blog? Was it a tweet or a blog? She did a novel that was all in one of those social media platforms. Um, but with your output, Joyce, uh, I suspect your frequency of tweets would be on the nanosecond scale. Um, <laughs> no, tweeting is something that I don't consider integral to my life. I could very easily... <laughs> I mean, I wasn't doing it before a year or so ago. I could just stop it again. Whereas storytelling and working with characters and setting scenes and, 
and evoking some sort of verisimilitude in the world. That's very rewarding and, and very exciting. That's the reason I read, you know, read passages of Thomas Hardy or, or James Joyce. You know, the, the world is evoked in this wonderfully vivid way. To me, that's very, that's very exciting. Is there a mission, Edgar, to, to your work? I, I get the sense that on some level you want us to experience American history in a very personal, uh, tangible way. Well, that was, never, um, that was never part of my plan. It just sort of happened that uh, some of these books were set in the past. But if you think about it, all novels are set in the past. And some have a wider focus to include national events and personages, others narrower focus to just about a family or a relationship. And then when I read Professor Carroll's book about time, I found a way to deny that I write historical novels. <laughs> 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 and, and he came up with a theory called the Eternalist Theory of Time. Would you like to explain that to everybody? I would like it if you explained it. That would be great. <laughs> Whoa, well, this is a high right. wire act. Now, when someone asks me that, I just say, I write eternalist novels. That's what I do. <laughs> and, um, but um, uh, really, I, I was trying to, in terms of this discussion, I was trying to think about the, what interests me about science is, is the philosophical issue involved in all scientific research. For instance, as to uh, the brain. Uh, why did I make uh, the character in, the, in Andrew's brain a cognitive scientist? Because I wanted uh, uh, someone to speak with authority about self-estrangement. And he says at a certain point, how can I think about my brain if it's my brain doing the thinking? And you, you see the dissociation right there, which explains uh, uh, the, the miserable life he's had. And then I, I realized that this is a, a battle that's going on today between the, between the neuroscientists and the philosophers of mind. This is a, this is a battle and it's of great consequence because if it turns out that neuroscientists can someday replicate the brain in a computer, and there are some people I think in Switzerland who are trying to do that now, and even though billions and billions of connections are involved, their position is that the brain is finite. And that it Well, that would be Swiss brains are finite. <laughs> well, that, they, they do eat a lot of chocolate there, that's <laughs> true. But uh, when that happens, um, presumably, uh, when we can replicate the brain, uh, it will have consciousness. And at that point, uh, all the old stories we've been telling ourselves since the Bronze Age are finished. They're, they're, and the, the idea of what it means to be human is, is transformed. But I don't really understand. Like, work like that, is that not just ignoring the fact that you need a body, that consciousness is embodied, that the, the, you know, the, the molecules coursing around in our bloodstream affect how we feel, affect our emotions? So, I mean, maybe you might be better to talk about that. But <laughs> 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 I, so I don't well, understand this idea that you can just take the brain a away and have it on its own, and somehow you're going to have something like a human mind. Hmm. Well, there's, um, it's actually not completely clear whether uh, the actual subjective experience of being alive and awake and, and, and aware and seeing red and hearing middle C and tasting sour and so on depends on being made out of human flesh. That is whether you want to be a, a meat chauvinist about consciousness or whether it's a question of processing patterns of information so that a suitably configured robot or android uh, could be considered to be but conscious. But even thoughts that come into our head often depend on the physical state of our body. You know, if you're stressed well, or you have slept, negative thoughts. Well, as communicated to the brain through, through neurons. And so in this science fiction scenario in which the, you have an artificial brain, that would include inputs from uh, signals that would replicate the sensation of you know, fingertips and eardrums and retinas okay. and so on. Or so that other kinds of inputs. Or other kinds of inputs. have no sort of body analog. But it does turn out to be easier. I mean, uh, 
people have been struggling to make artificial intelligence for a long time. And one of the hot topics in, in artificial intelligence these days is putting it inside a robot. And you put your attempt at a, a, a learning uh, intelligent program and give it a body and give it a face. And they are very quickly much better than any of the purely um, software attempts at making something that seems alive and human. This, this actually has been played out in fiction, as many themes in philosophy of science and philosophy of mind have been, often in science fiction. I mean, in, in popular pop science fiction, there is an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation in which they had to f decide whether it would be ethical to dismantle Lieutenant Com Commander Data to reverse engineer him, whether this would be dis disassembling a machine or tantamount to murder. And you know, how do you know? You ask him, are you conscious? And he says, yes, but oh yeah, but he's been programmed to say yes. And is there really <laughs> someone home in there who's actually feeling something, or is it just a bunch of programming? But then, you know, how do I know that you're not just a bunch of programming that's been wired up to say that you're conscious? So these are philosophical issues that have been played out in fiction. Can I ask a question of the scientists here? So much of our lives are genetically determined. We've inherited things, you know, when we were born. So how what is the analog with artificial intelligence? There's no... In, there's no, no is, is there a genetic code that generates artificial intelligence, the, the specification? Well, where, where would that come from? I yeah. mean, what sense? Well, intelligence, any intelligent system would have to learn, but it would have to be equipped with uh, algorithms for learning or mechanisms that take in inputs and change as a result. And the equivalent to nature, I would say, would be in the nature-nurture transferred to human-made systems would be the learning algor algorithms that you program into the system would be like the nature, and then the way it actually processes information and changes as a result would be the equivalent of nurture. At, but one, I, at I, one point would it become autonomous, though? You're programming something that's very complex, but you're, you're programming it. Is there yes. some point at which oh. it's going to say, I'm so, on my own? or it, something. That's it, it, what the part we, we find hard to comprehend. It certainly could be possible. Well, there, if to, just to continue the analogy, uh, natural selection would be the process that gave rise to the complexity of the human brain or the brains of other animals that go ahead and do learning. This, in this case, it would be duplicated by a human engineer in the same way that a lot of natural systems like, uh, you know, like, like wood and like uh, plants could be replicated by human engineers. Uh, and of course, natural, Darwin's great insight was that natural selection simulated an engineer without there actually being any engineering. Very slow. But very slow, yeah. Very slow process. Yeah. Well, some engineers work slowly. <laughs> Taking your point, though, and going back to something that you said, Joe, um, is it, and, and referencing something that you said also, Joyce, I mean, is it possible to even conceive of an artificial intelligence autonomous uh, entity without its connection to the creator. So if there was a DNA genetic code for artificial intelligence, it would have to begin with the human creators who actually, it, it's impossible to imagine it in the abstract, right? It's got to be connected to the human creators. Well, the human creator could have designed it, but then once designed, it goes uh, trundling off by itself, seeking energy sources, using its own internal information processing to try to attain goals. I mean, th in other words, that's a fancy way of saying there's nothing that makes it impossible to build a robot. It's very, very difficult to build a robot that can duplicate what a human could do, but presumably there's no barrier in principle. And then the question is, would it actually be conscious in the sense of there being someone home feeling someone something? Well, that's the what's sometimes called the, the so-called hard problem of consciousness. Would the it be able to write? <laughs> it, uh, uh, would it be able to tweet? <laughs> you know, there's, did there's you, the did you mention John Cyril? Did I hear you mention? I haven't mentioned him, the no. The philosopher of mind who did an experiment to show a computer seeming to demonstrate intelligence and doing all the right things without having any idea of what it was doing. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole idea of artificial intelligence doesn't suggest necessarily consciousness. Uh, that's Searle. Now, that's right Searle's now. idea? Pardon? Well, that, that's Searle's idea? Yeah. 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 Searle actually would argue that artificial intelligence, well, that, that just implementing rules 
uh, the way a computer does, because there is no consciousness, uh, uh, that shows that consciousness does depend on having a uh, being actually made out of flesh and having a uh, having a brain. That uh, if it was just rules, then uh, you could imagine someone, uh, a person in a room implementing a very, very, very complicated set of rules for translating Chinese, but he still would not understand a word of Chinese. Ergo, following a bunch of rules and understanding Chinese, according to Cyril's argument, are not the same thing. And you can't Turing's, argument, Turing's argument would be, if you can fool somebody with consciousness, then that is a threshold that's important in some way. I right? took a very depressing quiz on the internet recently. Uh, it was, they had 20 poems. 10 of them had been written by human beings and 10 of them had been artificially intelligently generated. And usually I'm really good at this, but it was like 50-50. I yeah. could not tell <laughs> which poems had been written by human beings. Now, they didn't pick sonnets, right? They picked more sort of modernist experimental things. Uh, but I think that the, what we're working toward in the field is an idea that consciousness is not so much a threshold. That there are matters of degrees. No one thinks that those computer programs who wrote these poems are consciousness or artistic, or are conscious or artistic or literary in any way, but that's because they lack a whole bunch of other things that we associate mm -hmm. with consciousness. And it might be that there's just completely different ways to be conscious, and when we do get artificial intelligence, it'll be consciousness in a way that is practically, it'll be conscious in a way that is practically unrecognizable as human. Well, even in our own experience, there are so many different kind ways to be conscious, aren't there? You know, in a 24-hour period, we'll go through Yeah, and I've experienced sometimes six of them in a weekend. <laughs> I, yeah, all six. You know, a lot of writers are referred to as having uh, sort of scientific attributes in some way. I'm interested, uh, do you think Dostoevsky, who's described often as a very psychological, a, a kind of inner consciousness sort of writer, would be a good psychiatrist? <laughs> uh, I, suspect he, I suspect he would. Uh, he was certainly a very psychological writer and kind of anticipated Freud's unconscious. Uh, his characters wrestle with the very dilemma that I mentioned in response to your first question, namely how do we reconcile our common sense view of consciousness as involving something immaterial with the discovery of science that it's just a bunch of neurons. And in the Brothers Karamazov, he has uh, Alyosha and his brother actually pondering this imponderable, it's just wiggling little tails of cells in our, in our uh, mm. head, and that's all of my experience. And they were grappling with that very dilemma. I suspect Walt Whitman, uh, Edgar, would be a terrific astronaut. I am a fellow who wonders why Astronomers don't run screaming from their telescopes. So the answer is, uh, I would not make a good astronaut. No. Oh. Well, but Whitman had a curiosity and a sense of adventure about the future, and it seemed like he would want to sign up to go to the moon if he were alive in the well, 1960s. Well, um, uh, uh, do I get to take a pad and pencil sure. with me? Okay. I mean, I think you would have probably come up with something slightly more inventive than one yeah. small well, step for man, I'm, one giant leap for <laughs> mankind. I'm quite serious in, in wondering why cosmologists don't go crazy. Uh, why, why they treat it as, a, as an adventure and as a, and an intellectual uh, game when it's really quite hideous to contemplate. I don't understand That's why everyone except for cosmologists doesn't go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the universe is out there. We live, I think what the implicit question here is, we live in this absolutely bizarre, challenging, difficult to understand universe. And I'm privileged enough to like, get paid as my full-time job to think about what it all means and what it does and so forth. And yeah, I feel bad for people who uh, don't get that privilege. Are you, you terrified know. about cosmology? Well, the what terrifies you? The difference is scientists are always very hopeful. Um, for instance, um, Einstein, no matter what the difficulties were, he, he had this scientific idea that eventually things could be figured out. But Wittgenstein, the German philosopher, Austrian philosopher, said no matter how many of the scientific questions we'll manage to answer, in fact, all of them, we will still not have gotten, touched the problem. So that's, that's the difference between the scientific optimism 
and sort of philosophical despair. Would you say that Wittgenstein discovered dark matter? <laughs> <laughs> In a big way. Um, Could have been Kierkegaard, although he was less dark than I, Wittgenstein. I, I think you've just insulted the ghost of Wittgenstein. <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> I think so. <clears throat> I think so. But, well, we've come to the end. I, as always in these sessions, get completely lost and lose track of time completely. We've come to the end. I want to thank Sean and Edgar and Joe and Joyce and Stephen. Thank you so much. Thank you.